Okay, hey everybody, so I've had some issues where now not only is my camera not working on my laptop, neither is my mic. So I literally have no way other than this of communicating this information to you. So I apologize for the video of my TV. But anyways, this should at least get us a little bit of what we want. So um, let's start with this. So we're talking about biogeochemical cycles, okay? And there's not been a lot of consensus on this on any level. Like I can't find a consistent message from AP teachers or even online resources. So some of this might be confusing, but at least it's that way for everybody, okay? So let's start talking about some of the details here. So we're going to first go over the carbon cycle and the water cycle or the hydrologic cycle. Um, and what I'd recommend you do is take a little time and pause the video and go back and read through these and make sure you understand the big ideas that you need to have from this information, okay? All right, so um, this is also for the nitrogen one. You can always come back to this when we get to it. And this one is for phosphorus. So again, I would spend a little time reading through this and making sure you understand all the major ideas because that's the important part. And the details you can just have on the... Um, the fact sheet that you should have during the AP test since it's all online, okay? At home test. So anyways, let's come over here to this. So what elements are you? What elements make you up? It's important to know this just so you understand what uh, organisms are trying to do at all times. They're trying to get a collection of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Chon, C-H-O-N, and P, phosphorus. These are very important to all living things. In fact, percent mass in your body, most is oxygen, of course, from all the water, and hydrogen there from all the water, but um, you also have a little bit of hydrogen mixed in with some carbon. And uh, these guys, nitrogen and phosphorus, small amounts percent-wise, but very important roles and responsibilities. That's why it's important that all creatures get these things. And we're going to talk about uh, carbon, water, nitrogen, and phosphorus in today's uh, experiment. I used to um, have a huge crush on a girl named Betsy Chan. Crawford, C-H-O-N, Chon. And so we used to make fun of that and not make fun of it, but it was a good memory tool in class whenever we'd uh, talk about the organic elements. So continuing on, uh, what I'd recommend is you should probably go in on our Canvas page and watch all these Shy Show reviews. I think I put them up there for you. Please watch over them because they do a good job, a better job, I think, of maybe explaining this. Uh, so maybe use my video as an intro to learn the basics and then uh, they can explain more of the details there for you. And that would be the same, of course, for nitrogen and phosphorus. So these are the terms you're going to have to know. And this is where, again, things are confusing. So I know that there should be one basic definition for all these things, but there doesn't seem to be. Okay. So, produces the chemical as a source, removes the chemical as a sink, and stores the chemical as a reservoir is a basic way to think of it. But real life isn't so cut and dried. Some things are kind of both. Some things, the terms are interchangeable, and it just gets really confusing. So, uh, the basic premise I think that all of you should have is that, to a certain extent, everything is a reservoir. Everything is storing whatever that chemical is for a short period of time or a long period of time. Now, your standard says reservoirs store for a long periods of time, okay? But at the end of the day, if it's storing it, it's a reservoir. Now, uh, it can be storing it, but if like that storage is perfectly balanced, how much it takes in and how much it gives out, if that little thing is balanced there, in fact, let me try some arrows here. So with reservoirs, you have a balance of what's coming in and what's going out, okay? They equal each other. Now. If you're considered to be a sink, a sink is a type of reservoir, okay? But it's a type of reservoir where they're taking in very, um, they're taking in a way more than they're letting out. So more is coming in than is going out, okay? And that would be as compared to a source, which would be a reservoir where more is going out, right, than is coming in. That's why it's a source, because it's giving out more than it's taking in. So that's the way I've kind of learned to think about this. Is sinks and sources are reservoirs, but at that moment, they're either giving out more or they're taking in more, making them a source or making them a sink. Okay, reservoirs are kind of balanced. Now, moving on over to this. So this is my brainstorm. And again, this is me as a teacher, number one, but also as a you know science person. These are the best I could come up with. And they're probably not perfect, but I think they do a good job of at least summing up some of the ones. And there might even be some misconceptions in here we can talk about. Let's look at this. A CO2 source. That means producing more than it's taking in. So obviously that's going to be animals because we're breathing out carbon dioxide. So we're a source of that. 
Fossil fuels would be a good source because you're burning them to release CO2. So you're adding CO2. It's releasing a lot. And burning forests, of course, or cutting them down. All those things would make a source of CO2 because you're actively releasing it into the environment. Excuse me. A sink would be something where... Um, let me get rid of the notification there. A sink would be something where it's taking in more, right? So plants are taking in carbon dioxide. Uh, the ocean surface, you could say, but... That gets kind of confusing. So what I'd say is plants definitely take it in. At the bottom of the ocean, CO2 is being combined with calcium to form calcium carbonate, a.k.a. limestone. So that's a sink. Uh, any place that's actively being taken in. Uh, CO2 reservoir. So this is where it's stored and it's kind of balanced. So in the atmosphere, CO2 uh, is very much balanced. There's a lot of exchange, right? Uh, carbon dioxide in, carbon dioxide out. It's pretty even. Um uh, although I guess you could say it's, it's become more of a sink as more and more uh, CO2 is being stored up there uh, from all the fossil fuels are burning. But for right now, let's look at this. Um, the ocean would also be a reservoir because there's tons of CO2 stored in there, as well as limestone. Uh, and that's in the layers of rock. So if you're talking about the largest reservoir on Earth, you would have to say limestone um, because there's tons of CO2 trapped in carbonate or um, calcium carbonate here from limestone, um, way deep underground. And it's oftentimes released, uh, slowly over time, but, uh, it's stored down there for a very long time. The ocean has a lot as well, but, uh, it's actively exchanging it. So, um, limestone is more of a reservoir because it's stored there for much longer. Okay. So this is the important part, being able to label what these are sources, sinks, and reservoirs. Uh, this works better for me with carbon than anything else. Um, but we'll get to the rest in a second. So let's look here. So we have fossil fuel emissions. If y'all can see that right there. So fossil fuel emissions are going to be a source because you're releasing it into the air. Okay. The atmosphere is the reservoir because it's stored up here for a long time. All right. You have, uh, let's see over here, volcanoes. So volcanoes are going to be sources because they're releasing the CO2 that we have stored underground. Um, as those tectonic plates shift and, and create friction, they release all those uh, carbonates from the limestone there, as well as organic matter. Uh, vegetation, that's going to be a uh, reservoir or even a sink, I guess you could think of it that way, because the vegetation is taking the CO2 in and it's storing it for a long time. Sink and reservoir are oftentimes I've seen used interchangeably. You have the animals here, which would be a source. Uh, over here, you see the uh, the man cutting down trees. That's a source because you're you know you're sending more CO2 into the atmosphere uh, by cutting those trees down. The trees decay, and that decay creates carbon dioxide. You also have more organic matter in the soil. So anytime you have soil, you've got to have uh, decaying dead things and bacteria. They're the ones who are decaying it, and they perform respiration. So these decaying decomposer bac bacteria are producing lots of CO2 um, as well as other greenhouse gases, but CO2, uh, primarily. And so, um, that's where a lot of uh, CO2 comes from as well. So that would totally be a source. Now, uh, you'll notice here we have the surface of the ocean. There's lots of this feedback interchange. Okay. And that means that it's pretty evenly exchanged. So that would be a reservoir. Okay. Uh, marine biota. So what they probably mean there is, um, zooplankton. Okay. Zooplankton are animal like plankton, and they're going to be a source. All right. But as they die, right, the plankton, uh, phytoplankton or zooplankton, they're going to go down to the bottom. And, um, so it's going to become a sink down here, the sediments, all their dead organic bodies are going to decay, right? Um, or even the carbon dioxide they produce is going to move its way down and it's going to settle into the limestone, but that's going to actively be absorbing it, which makes it a sink. But then once it enters the ground, it becomes a reservoir of limestone way deep down here. You can see this uh, spelled out a little more clearly maybe here where they label everything. You might want to go back and forth between these two slides to see them better. But if you're looking here, we have a source. All right, fossil fuels here. All right, we have a reservoir like we mentioned. Feedback is a constant exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean. The ocean being, of course, a reservoir. Um, the plants here, you see being a sink, they're taking it in. The animals here is a source. The vegetation being a reservoir where it's stored. Again, sink, reservoir, they're kind of the same thing. Um, over here, we have a source. That's the decaying organic matter. Uh, volcanoes, this is another source, although it doesn't mention it up there. Uh, we have a source of marine biota. You can see them there. And the sink of the sediments at the bottom. 
So this is nowhere near perfect, but I think it does a good job of explaining most of the ins and outs. The major thing is this, understanding the role of the lithosphere, um, which you can see right here. So the lithosphere, litho, if you've ever seen uh, Indiana Jones, you might have seen the word litho uh, at the start there of the, uh, of the movie, of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Litho here meaning rock. So when we talk about the biosphere, we mean all the living things on Earth. Okay, sphere meaning the Earth, right? So biosphere, then you've got the... Um, hydrosphere, all the water on Earth. And in this case, you have the lithosphere, or the rocks on Earth. So uh, a lot of rocks are calcium carbonate, a.k.a. limestone. And that's calcium carbonate, as you see right there. And there's lots of carbon dioxide stored in mineral form. Okay, okay. beautiful clean coal. Can coal be clean? Well, no, you can clean it. But that doesn't mean that it's clean. CO2, along with radioactive particles and lots of other nasty stuff, still gets out, unfortunately, through the process. Although we guess we suppose we can minimize it, but uh, not quite as much as we would like. Uh, over here, we have fossil fuels and their basic formation. Don't forget when we talk about fossil fuels that um, oil is primarily gotten from the bottom of oceans. All right, so anytime they're mine or drilling for oil, that area used to be an ocean at one point or another. And uh, all those decaying organic, I should say, uh, plankton and algae, as they die, they fall to the bottom, and their remains become oil over time. If you're looking for coal, you're looking at plants. Decaying plant matter is typically what becomes coal. But uh, let's move on here. If CO2 emissions were visible, again, all produced there by the combustion of fossil fuels. That's another source. Okay. Um... Yeah, we know that. I'm uh, not going to do that. Uh, water cycle from memory. So the basic idea is this. Sunlight heats up water. Water evaporates all right, into water vapor. Water vapor you can't see. If you're looking at a lake or a river, it's actually evaporating right in front of your face. You just can't see that uh, because water vapor is invisible. But when it goes up here into the sky, the sky is really cold up there. And so when it hits the sky, right, that water vapor condenses to form clouds. Clouds are liquid water particles floating up in the air, okay? They form around pieces of dust, et cetera, up there, and uh, that's how clouds form. It's just dust and water. But anyways, that liquid water stays up there, and it moves over the land. And then when they get big enough, those water droplets, right, gravity can pull them back down to Earth and make precipitation. So um, that's the basic ins and outs. So we have evaporation going up. Right? Condensation to make the clouds. Precipitation falls it down. So we have a big old reservoir of water here in the ocean. We have a reservoir up here in the atmosphere. Um, but you could also think of the ocean here, the surface of the ocean at least, as a source. Because it's adding sea, or excuse me, water into the atmosphere. But as we look, it moves over land and it starts to fall. Now when it falls, then it hits the slope here. Slopes are called watersheds. Because they shed water, like off of a duck's back is the way I often think of it. But a watershed sheds water, and it basically starts to run off. It runs off the side of the hill, the side of the watershed, into the lakes and rivers and streams, and then it makes its way back to the ocean. Now, you also have way up here, sometimes that um, precipitation will fall on mountaintops and freeze. And you got a little bit of sublimation here. For those who remember that from physical science or chemistry, sublimation is when you take a solid and turn it straight into a gas. And that can happen up in the low pressures at the top of mountaintops um, when it's under intense sunlight. But if we look here, so we have watersheds running down, but sometimes water also goes into the ground and that's called infiltration. So it can infiltrate into the ground. And when it gets down there, that water will then percolate, which means to move through the ground. Um, people often say that coffee is percolating. That means the, the water is moving through the coffee grounds. So in percolation, the water is moving through the ground. Uh, you see the ground discharge, discharge here, meaning the ground water is coming back up into a spring or into a lake of some kind. Um, but either way, it can also be stored underground in those aquifers. Uh, one of the big ones you're going to want to remember is the Ogallala Aquifer. Ogallala, and uh, that's um, from one of the units a little bit later on. But the Ogallala uh, Aquifer is in the Midwest, where all our farmers are, and that's what all the farmers use to get their water from. But don't forget, they're using it up more than it's being replenished. And so once it's gone, all those crops are going to die, and that's going to be a bad thing. So anyways, um, percolation all the way through. Um, sometimes, though, it gets intercepted here by a little bit of uh, transpiration. So what that means is these plant roots pull some of the water up, and um, plants don't have hearts, so if they're going to move 
water from the roots where they absorb it to the leaves where they need it, right? They have to get it to go up through the stem or up through the trunk. And so how do you do that as a plant? Well, when you're a plant, you have a leaf. And on the bottom side, let's see if I can draw a little leaf here. And it's not bad. More like an acorn, I guess. But anyways, so when you got your leaf here, uh, on the bottom side of the leaf are these little holes and openings. These little holes are called stomata. What stomata do is they allow uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide to be um, exchanged in and out. But also on the bottom of these little holes, water will oftentimes evaporate out of these little stomata, these little mouths on the bottom of the plant. And when that water is evaporated from there, water has a tendency to cohere together. That means H2O particles, right, because they have, you guys should know this from biology, right, a slightly positive charge, slightly negative charge, so they have a hydrogen bonding going on, water particles will stick to other water particles. And so when one particle evaporates, right, this one evaporates into the air, it pulls this one up to replace it, which pulls the ones from down below. And that's how you pull water all the way up from the roots is because um, it makes its way all the way up to the leaf. And it's all because water's evaporating from here, pulling more water up from the ground uh, through transpiration. And so transpiration is a really big, important um, biological term, a uh, big part of plant life. That's why you got to water your plants often is because they need water to um, get the circulation through their system so they can get um, stored nutrients from the roots to the leaves or from the leaves to the roots um, with their xylem and phloem. Okay, I think that's good enough. So reservoirs in the ocean, deep under the ground, you have sinks like the um, infiltration here where it's going into the ground, right? Um, you have sources, which can be lakes and rivers and streams as well as uh, the ocean. And then ice is a great example of another reservoir where it's stored, okay? Now, nitrogen and phosphorus, our last two here. The biggest things you're going to want to know about nitrogen and phosphorus is nitrogen is primarily taking place in the air and phosphorus is primarily taking place in the ground. Uh, SciShow does a great job of explaining both of these things and uh, better than I could do. So please watch that when you get some time. And again, that's up on Canvas. Excuse me. Now, if we're taking a look right here, um, let's look at the nitrogen cycle. The basics of the nitrogen cycle is this. When you breathe in and out, the primary chemical you're breathing in is nitrogen. The Earth's atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. So when you're breathing in, you're not really breathing in oxygen. You're really breathing in nitrogen. Now, you do breathe in some oxygen. In fact, 20% of what you breathe in is O2. Okay? But that's only 20%. All right? And so 20 plus 78 is 98 or 99 even, because I guess it's technically 20.9%. So almost 99% of the atmosphere is either nitrogen or oxygen, and only less than 1% is anything else. And most of that 1% is argon. In fact, carbon dioxide, CO2, is only 0.04% of the total number of atoms in the atmosphere. Think about that. 0.04% is all that's used around the world to feed our plants. Like that's kind of crazy that that's all they need. But again, we know that number to be going up because of all the CO2 we're digging up from the underground in the reservoir and releasing it into the air when it's supposed to be stored. So that right there is what contributes to global warming because that number is supposed to be low. Anyways, that 78% nitrogen is important because it's useless. Plants and animals cannot use that nitrogen in its current form as N2. So what we got to do is we got to fix it. Think of the southern way of fixing things. I'm fixing it or I'm fixing to. Like it's, it's going to be fixed, all right? And when we fix it, it's going to be able to be used. So we're going to fix it. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about that. But anyways, so the nitrogen N2 is fixed and converted into a chemical that people and animals, I should say, not animals, plants, I should say, can use. So that is ammonia or NH3, okay? That ammonia can be absorbed by the roots and used for what the plant needs. Now, only some plants need ammonia. Other ones need nitrates and nitrites, NO2 and NO3. And so what you have is a process called nitrification. You'll notice here that we have these things called prokaryotes. And you know that from biology, prokaryotes are basically just bacteria. So bacteria are the things deep here underground that are collecting the N2 and converting it to ammonia or taking the ammonia and converting it to nitrates and nitrites, which are then used by plants. 
So ammonia can be used by plants, and um, nitrates and nitrites can be used by plants. Now, once everything is nitrified, right, NO2, well, it's kind of stuck there. So you have other bacteria who've taken on the role of denitrifying. In other words, taking the N2s and NO2s and NO3s and converting it back to N2. And that's the whole nitrogen cycle. So most nitrogen is stored up here, okay, in the air. That's the key, is N2 is stored up here in the air. And then it's either um, brought into the animals and plants or it's, um, or I should say, into the plants, or it's released back up into the atmosphere. But this is the reservoir right here, okay? Um, looking at another example, you might recognize this from class. So if we're looking at this right here, you'll see N2 can be fixed through either lightning strikes or nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So nitrogen fixation, which means it's being fixed, because right now it's useless. So let's fix it and make it something useful, in this case, NH3. Okay, now again, that NH3 is somewhat useful to plants, but it's better if we can nitrify it and change it into a nitrate or a, nit excuse me, a nitrate or a nitrite. And that process is called nitrification. Uh, and anyways, those nitrates end up getting sent up here into the plant and used. That term is assimilation, when it's assimilated into the plant. Now, you have ammonification here, which just basically means cows are pooping out fertilizer. Fertilizer is better known as ammonium, okay? Um, NH4 there, it should be a little plus. So NH4, ammonium, okay? And what it does is it, um, uh, it's another way to get ammonia, or I should say nitrogen, into the soil where the nitrifying bacteria can nitrify it, and so plants can use it. And any excess NO2, NO3 that's not used, a denitrifying bacteria going through the denitrification process, denitrification, they will convert it back into N2 and start the process again. If I were you, I would spend some time drawing the cycle out or saying it from memory, the order that it goes and what's going on in it. That would be a big help for you. And I'd do that maybe once a week. Go over the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle. Make sure you remember how that works. Okay, having the sheet in front of you will be helpful, but if you don't remember how it works, you're, you're kind of screwed. So please be sure to review over this and how it works. Watch my video again. Try to explain it to a friend or explain it to yourself um, multiple times until it gets stuck in your brain, okay? All right, nitrogen, of course, being super important in proteins, and we know proteins are important in the cell. Also, deoxyribonucleic acid, all of these have lots of uh, nitrogens in them. Nitrogenous bases might be something you remember from biology. Okay, uh, let's move it on over here. So we're not doing games in the hallway because those are stupid anyways. Uh, the phosphorus cycle. So phosphorus, you might notice it from ATP. Right, adenosine triphosphate and adenosine diphosphate. So the phosphates there are very, very, very important, uh, even in DNA molecules. So um, it's really, really oh, phospholipids, okay, and bones as well. Energy impulses. That's ATP again. So like these are phosphorus is a big deal. And here's the interesting thing about phosphorus, which is that it does not exist in the air. Okay, nitrogen is a constant source because you can just get it from the air as long as you have the right bacteria. Phosphorus, not so much. It's not a gas. So what does that mean for its cycle? That means phosphorus is primarily a mineral. It's in the rocks and soil. So whenever I think about phosphorus, I think about the rocks and soil, okay, having lots of phosphorus in it. Well, rocks have um, an issue being out in the world because rocks are often weathered. So the rocks with phosphorus in them get weathered into sediment, and that sediment will oftentimes release the phosphorus to the plants as they need it. Okay, It's also present in soil. But sometimes you get a little bit of runoff, so that's how lakes and streams get these minerals. Okay, And they carry it around the land, and they carry it uh, deep underground to aquifers, and plants pull it up right from the ground. So either it's pulled up from the soil or pulled up from lakes and streams and rivers and aquifers, all that phosphorus from the runoff from the weathering of these rocks. They release the phosphorus into the environment, and then plants absorb it, okay, through their roots, inorganic phosphate. And when they absorb it, they have uh, PO4 here. That's a phosphate group, for those who know their chemistry. And anyways, that phosphate group is important because we use it. Animals will then eat the plants that have the phosphate, all right, or the plants will use that phosphate to make things like ATP. But whether we're eating it, right, or plants are using it and converting it, ATP is being made and used. Well, eventually, like all parrots, they will die. Monty Python, dead parrot. 
skit. You should check it out. But anyways, parrots die here, and when they die, their bodies fall to the ground, where they decompose, and all that lovely phosphorus goes back into the ground. And over time, with tectonic plates shifting, you have the phosphorus being combined into minerals, and those minerals become rocks, and then those rocks make their way back to the surface where they're weathered, and this process starts again and again and again. It all starts and ends with dirt. Dirt and rocks with phosphorus, right, being breaking down, broken down, run off into the water, the phosphorus leaks in, the plants absorb it, the animals eat the plants, the plants... Uh, who live, use it for metabolism, and everybody's making ATP, and then everybody dies because all things die, unfortunately. And then when they die, they return those good old phosphorus nutrients to the soil, et cetera, et cetera. That's why I typically will leave my leaves on the lawn to decompose because that's a way to put phosphorus back into my soil without having to add any unnecessary fertilizer. Uh, that's why leaves from plants drop around their um, around their roots, because when they decay, then they can uh, soak those um, leaves back up, the phosphorus specifically, to make more leaves. Okay, so that's the bio. Oop, a little uh, high on that little shot there. But uh, that and those are the ins and outs of um, the biogeochemical cycle. The main thing is always to remember that humans suck and that we typically uh, use fertilizers overly much and uh, cut trees and stuff down and all that phosphorus and other nutrients get washed away, so the land becomes unusable. And then to top it off, when all that fertilizer um, leaves the land, it moves into the water where you get explosive growth of algae and aquatic plants and stuff. And then you get eutrophication, which causes more death and destruction. Good job, humans. So... Uh, you should know enough about both of those things and those those topics. And uh, if you want to watch the SciShow stuff, I'd recommend it. Otherwise, this is my third attempt to do this exact same thing. And I hope this video takes and I hope that it helped. And uh, if not, you can always give me a call. Um, my phone number is up on Canvas. So, love you guys. Take care. This is Mr. Ellis signing out. Deuce, deuces. This is my fingers. Deuces. Okay. <laughs>